All right, today, this morning, we're starting and kicking off our summer teaching series we've simply entitled Beatitudes, the Beatitudes. And we'll be looking at these nine beautiful statements uh, that begin the most famous and, and actually the longest sermon that Jesus uh, ever preached, known as the Sermon on the Mount. I actually uh, thought about uh, naming our series Summer on the Mount. <laughs> That would have been uh, clever. Uh, just thought of that too late. But uh, if you know <laughs> if you know anything about the Bible, uh, Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, so that's the second half of your Bible, right? It's split up in two. Uh, chapters five, six, and seven in the book of Matthew is all about this one sermon, and it's spectacular. It's really a revolutionary uh, uh, treaty on on how to live radically uh, and wholeheartedly for God through faith. Not simply through external actions of obeying or, or keeping the law. In fact, we should and could, we, we probably should do an entire series just on that sermon alone. Now, at the heart of this sermon is an even more famous sermonette, is what I'm calling, and it's the sermonette called the B Attitudes. And, and, and the B comes from blessed, so it's the blessed or, or blessed attitudes that we have. And almost every Christian, almost every uh, culture in the world understands or has heard about the B Attitudes. In fact, many religious gurus from other faith uh, groups quote Jesus as they are so powerful. So the preamble, if you will, to the Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitude, these nine uh, beautiful truths, beautiful statement that Jesus says. In fact, some scholars say there's actually eight and, and the last two are combined. We're actually going to split them up and talk about nine throughout the summer. Now, what I want to say right up front, uh, it, this is going to be a challenging series, but it's also going to be an encouraging season, okay? Uh, this will both challenge us, as some of these principles are in direct conflict and contrast to culture's values. You'll see what I mean as we kind of uh, progress through this series. And at the same time, they're super, super relevant for all of us. So Jesus starts off, and he says, blessed are those who, and then he fills in the blank, and that reality really transcends time, right? Like, who doesn't want to be blessed, right? In fact, that word blessed there is translated from the Greek word makairos, which means happy. So Jesus is speaking, and he's saying that, that to the, you know, he's speaking to the universal language of every person that has ever lived on planet Earth. And he's answering the question that's just as relevant today than it, as it was 2,000 years ago. It's just as relevant today to, uh, you know, the, the executive in the corner office in New York City, and it's just as relevant to the person that just stumbled upon that hillside that day to hear Jesus. Jesus speak. And Jesus says, hey, do you want to be happy? Do you want to be blessed? Well, well, yeah, who, who doesn't want that? So here is how. Blessed are those who. In, in fact, I love that about our God. Uh, culture would have you believe that God is, is some cosmic killjoy. Right? He doesn't want you to be happy. He, he wants to rain on your parade, and he actually wants to take something for you or, or, or make you follow all these rules and do all this stuff. Do you know how many thou shalt nots are in that Bible? Right? <laughs> right? And, and, and sadly, sometimes even within Christ, Christian circles and Christians, we kind of put this on people too. Have you ever heard the statement, uh, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. Right? As, as if th those two things are, there's a big dichotomy between being happy and, and being holy. And maybe God's favorite song or Jesus' favorite song is, you know, if you're happy and you know it, Repent, like don't be happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so what we say is, okay, I want to be happy, and, and church people are not the happy people, so, so I'm not going to do the church thing. I'm, I'm not doing this Christianity thing. Uh, but that, that is a false dichotomy because, surprise, you can be a follower of Jesus and be happy. In fact, I would argue that the happiest people in the world are those that follow Jesus. God wants us to be happy. He desires to bless us, and he gives us the principles by which we can be. But as we'll see in a moment, these are going to surprise you. In fact, the kingdom of God has been called by many the upside-down kingdom because it's flying in direct contrast in, uh, to the patterns of this world. So as we go through this, it's going to kind of get into our face a little bit and challenge us. Probably for some of us, uh, our, 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 our reaction would be very similar to what uh, Arnold Drummond gave his older brother Willis. This look, that's probably going to be some of us, right? <laughs> what, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Yeah, Jesus really did say that, and he was serious. Uh, 
And what I might have been praying for is that we would be really deeply impacted powerfully by the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let me set up the context of what's happening here. Uh, I want you guys to understand where we're at. So we're going to begin in chapter 4, actually, and set the scene. Jesus is about to usher in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. It says this, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in the synagogues. So if you want to know what he was teaching, he was teaching the Sermon on the Mount. You could read that in chapters 5, 6, and 7. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And if you want to know what kind of healings he was doing, you can just go ahead and read the, 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 the last two chapters there, 8 and 9, after the Sermon on the Mount. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. That's the power of the gospel, everybody. It's always accompanied by signs and wonders. It's always uh, verified by signs and wonders. Let me say it this way. When the gospel is preached, powerful things happen. And then it says large crowds. Some actually estimate anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 people at a time. We're following him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So this is kind of the context. This is what's going on. Jesus is ministering, and the good news is spreading. And so the crowds are forming, and they're getting larger and larger and larger. And now they include people from all different types of regions. And throughout the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, whenever he's speaking about Jesus and his crowds, he talks about large crowds a lot. And he's speaking about a variety variety of people that would be there. Most of the people that were following Jesus had a healthy appreciation of Jesus, but there was also those in the crowd that were kind of seeking out, who is this Jesus? I'm not really sure about this, and how does these teachings relate to my life? And then there were people there who were actually skeptical about Jesus, and, and at some point, uh, there were even enemies uh, of Jesus that were there in the crowd. So there's a variety of people in these crowds. By the way, <clears throat> I love that. I love that because uh, it's not very dissimilar to us as we gather here today. See, we're a crowd of people, right? Now, we're not on a mountainside. We're on a mill side. Ah, all right, all right. <laughs> hey, listen, if you're new with us today, hang in there. The dad jokes don't get any better, okay? Just, just saying. <laughs> but we're a crowd of people, and, and our spiritual makeup is people of different ages and different stages in life. And I would say most of us are, are followers of Jesus, appreciative of Jesus. Some are very uh, committed followers of Jesus. Yet there are some of us in this room that are still seeking they're like, man, I'm still trying to wrestle with what Jesus is saying, who Jesus is, what these tenets of faith mean for my life. And then there's probably some of us who are skeptical. I'm not really sure. I, I, I'm, I, I don't know about this. And that's okay. We welcome all of you here because Jesus has a word for all of us today. So Jesus gives this message specifically to his disciples, but he wanted the entirety of the crowds to hear it. In fact, we could say that the crowds gathering is the reason that Jesus actually gives this message. So here's what, how it starts. He begins, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. So what he's doing is he's using the acoustics of the Sea of Galilee and the backstop of the mountain to amplify and project his voice. If you ever wondered how Jesus taught to so many people, that's what he kind of does. And so he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Some translator, translators actually translate the Greek here uh, word for word, and they said, and, and where it says, Jesus opened his mouth and began to speak. And it, by way of information, that's like totally redundant, right? Of course, you open your mouth to speak. That's how you say things. But, but the point is really rhetorical. It's a way of saying, hey, slow down, Right? Pay attention. What's about to happen is important. This is really important. Something new, something different is going to be said. So here's how Jesus starts. He says, blessed are 
the, and, and I want to pause here just for effect for one second, okay? So imagine the crowd of people following Jesus, right? People from all ages, people from all faith groups, people from all different backgrounds and social groups. They're leaning in because they can't wait to see what is Jesus going to say? Who are those that are going to be blessed? Who are the ones that are going to be blessed? So they all lean in and turn their ears to Jesus. Now, what some of them were expecting Jesus to say is this, the blessed are going to be the religious right? Those that follow all the rules, those that got it all together. I mean, the, the, in, in the Old Testament, that was the prerequisite for blessing. It was an if-then kind of mentality. If you follow what, Jesus, what, what God says, then you will receive this blessing. It was always if-then. Certainly it's those people. If it's not those people, then maybe it's the politically affluent, those that have a name, those that are important in society. Those are the ones that are truly blessed. If it's not those people, then maybe it's those that come from like a, a real important spiritual lineage, right? Like you're from Father Abraham, had many sons. Maybe that's you, right? Yeah, I, got, I see you. You know that growing up, right? <laughs> maybe that's your lineage. Or maybe God it, it, through Jesus is going to do something new and he's going to usher in this military might and he's going to uh, make us mighty and blessed so we could fight against the opposition of the Roman Empire. Or maybe like some of you today here, you're thinking Jesus is going to say, blessed are those who work hard. Blessed are those who help themselves. You ever heard of that one? Blessed are those who fulfill their dreams, who, who make something of themselves. Blessed are those who make a name for themselves. Blessed are those of great wealth. So they're leaning in with bated breath as they're saying, okay, who's going to be blessed and who are the blessed? And Jesus does on the outset in his sermon something that, that, they, that, uh, that, that takes everything you've experienced and they've experienced in life and they, everything that they've expected to happen and turns it upside down. He flips it upside down because the beatitudes of the kingdom are in complete opposition to the patterns of this world. So let me show you what he says. Blessed are the poor. In spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to study today. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That will be next week. So you're kind of picking up how we're going to unfold this series. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for food, but for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will show mercy. I think we have more judgment in the world today than we've ever had at any point in time. And we need some people that are merciful. Come on, somebody. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We need some peacemakers too, by the way. And then a lot of scholars combine these last two. We're actually going to uh, separate them. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12, blessed are, the, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evils against you because of me. And then it says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, what's amazing about these principles is that Jesus didn't come just to teach these to us. He actually came to live these out. So, so he embodies kindness, uh, goodness, gentleness, and, and love. And, and this is why I believe uh, even atheists, even other religious gurus, are, are, uh, don't, they don't necessarily believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but they still think he was a great man because he actually lived out what he preached. But he didn't just come to model this for us so that we could adore him for that. He came and modeled and taught so that we could take on his life. So 2 Corinthians says that we're transformed little by, little by little, glory by glory, into the image of Jesus. And I've asked God that he would do a revival work in our hearts in this series as we allow these beatitudes to come live on the inside of us and in turn change everything around us. Now, there's a few things uh, I want you to notice before we kind of jump in and study this first one. There are three parts to every one of these principles, right? Uh, they each have an adjective. In fact, they all have the same adjective. It's blessed. Uh, the second part is that there is an identifier of who the blessed are. And those who are blessed, uh, Jesus identifies them. And, and they're in complete uh, uh, surprise to those listening. And then the third part is the assuring condition because they were blessed. So what 
what is the blessed assurance, right? And, and you're going to hear things like, well, blessed are those, uh, they will be the children of God. They will inherit the earth. They, they will be filled. And, and today we're going to look at theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the other thing that is really uh, crucial that you understand in these Beatitudes is that this, the Beatitudes reveal where true happiness comes from. True happiness. So that word blessed, we've already mentioned, means happy. And this happiness literally means that there's an internal joy that the world cannot give you. So let me say it this way. You are content. You are flourishing. You're not wavering. Completely indifferent in spite of your circumstances, in spite of what is happening around you. And that's really the word that Jesus is using here. So it's not happy uh, based on happenings or happenstance. So, for instance, if the sun is shining like today, woo, we're happy, right? When it doesn't shine like today, we're not as happy. When, whenever you have money, you're happy. But when you don't have money, you're not. Whenever your team wins, you're happy. Whenever your team loses, you're not happy. That's pretty much every Blazer fan in right now, right? <laughs> Help us, Lord Jesus. So, so, so that's normal people, right? Uh, happiness comes and goes with circumstances, but not the people of God, everybody. The people of God are supposed to have something deeper inside of them that, that regardless of what their circumstances are, we have this internal joy of the Lord. It's an internal satisfaction and sufficiency that goes beyond our outward circumstances uh, for happiness. Another thing I want you to notice is that these principles are called the be attitudes, not the do attitudes. So Jesus teaches the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of his big uh, thrust throughout this uh, sermon. And he's going to show the people uh, what God intends for them to do in their, in, in their lives as they follow him. And it starts with reshaping our attitudes. These are the attitudes that God wants to develop in the hearts of his believers. So these are descriptions of what God causes us to be rather than a description of what God wants us to do. It's critical that we understand this and, and uh, uh, that, that we get this. God places a premium on being because what we do flows out of what we are. So I say this a lot, and you've probably heard me say this a lot in, in previous messages. It's identity that drives behavior. When you know who you are, you're going to know what to do. See, the world will tell you that happiness begins on what you do, while God says true happiness begins with who you are. It's who you are that drives how you will live. And that's why this, these are called attitudes. We're going to get these attitudes inside our heart so we can live them out. All right, so let's jump into the first one and unpack this one. Blessed are the poor very interesting language, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of uh, heaven. Now that word spirit there, it actually uh, comes from the Greek word pneuma, which means soul. That's what he's talking about, the soul. So very important to notice, uh, it does not say blessed in spirit are the poor. Okay, so right off the bat, Jesus addresses one of the biggest myths as it relates to happiness, and that is essentially that only rich people are happy. Or, or some have said, no, 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 it's only the poor who are actually happy people. And Jesus says, no, it's not rich people who are happy. It's not poor people who are happy necessarily. Let me, let, let me tell you who's happy. The happy people are the people who are poor in spirit. And this is why this is the first beatitude and arguably the most important out of the nine beatitudes. In fact, some scholars claim that you can't have the other eight without having this first one. This is a fundamental characteristic of being a Christian. Becoming, being poor in spirit is the first thing that must happen in the life of everybody who enters the kingdom of God. And, and here's what it means, okay? So you can get all that God has for you when you realize, listen, you stand, you and I stand before God bankrupt. To be poor in spirit is to acknowledge that no matter how much you have, no matter how little you have, it is completely in, it, not dependent upon, upon God. Because we, every single minute we depend on him for everything that we need. It's, it's an attitude towards ourselves, towards yourself, in which you know and affirm that you have not lived the life to which God has called you, and that without him, you can't do so now even. 
So there's two words that can be used in the Greek for the word poor. And one is uh, very similar to what we would think of poor. So when we see somebody poor, we would say, oh, they just don't have enough money. That's a poor person. So that's one word. But that's not the word that's being used here. The word that's being used here is describing somebody who has nothing at all. So, so you're completely destitute. Right? It describes a beggar, desperately even ashamed to show his face or, or identity, make it known. Uh, it's someone who's totally dependent on somebody else. And, and that's the word the Bible uses. So, so blessed, happy, the happiest people are the ones who realize that they are completely destitute before God. That they are dependent on their heavenly father, whether they have a little or whether they have a lot. In fact, uh, let me show you uh, three other translations of this verse because it kind of tries to hit the same kind of theme. This is out of the New Living Translation. This is a translation that I uh, personally enjoy reading a lot. It says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize, watch this, their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Here's God's word translation. It says, blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. I actually like that phrase, spiritually helpless. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And then finally, out of the New Century Version, it says this, those people who know they, their great spiritual needs are happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. So, so here's the big idea if you're a note taker and you're kind of wanting to surmise it all. I'm going to try to simplify this as best as I can. The happiest people in the world, here's the big main idea for today, are the people that say this, Jesus, I need you. God, I, I just need you. I realize I bring nothing to the table. That's the mark of a person who is walking with God. Uh, let me show you this. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a famous preacher and theologian. He puts it this way. Being poor in spirit is a complete uh, absence of pride, a complete absence of self-assurance and of self-reliance. It, uh, it means a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. Now, again, this is why I say the Beatitudes uh, of the kingdom of God are in direct and complete opposition to the attitudes of the world. Think about the world for a second and, and what it sells us on the day, uh, what it sells us regularly every day, right? Self reliance, self confidence, and self expression. Believe in yourself. You got this. <laughs> you want to be happy? Express yourself. Realize your inner power and let the world see it, right? Assert yourself. Be proud of yourself. Grab your place in the sun. As, as Napoleon would say once, uh, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Like, like we're going to do what we need to do. You do you, boo-boo, right? And, and, and it's and it's in all aspects of life, like in parents, teachers, counselors, politicians, advertisers, uh, advertising, all tell us how great we actually are. Uh, <laughs> I remember my son, uh, he, he plays soccer, and he loves soccer, right? And so I'm sitting at the sidelines, and, I, and I'm that parent. I just am. I'll just be right up front. I'm cheering him on and, and encouraging him, right? And I'm just like, he's having, he's having a good game, and I'm just encouraging, come on, you can do this. You got this, right? Believe in yourself, Levi, right? And he makes a play on the ball, and he actually it leads to a goal. And so what he does is he starts, starts beating his chest, yeah, yeah, and he starts trash talking to the other kid, right? And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. No, that's, that's not what I meant. Like, what just happened? And everybody's like, yeah, that's the pastor's kid. Humility, humility, yeah, right? <laughs> now, now, please hear me for a second. <laughs> Being poor in spirit doesn't mean, like, you have to be weak, all right? It doesn't mean like standing in the background or, 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 or uh, lacking courage or not trying hard, not using the gifts and talents that God has given you. It's not this kind of false sense of humility. It simply means that this is the attitude of your heart. God, I can't do this without you. I need you. I admit my weakness. I'm not up for this. In my own strength, I will fall short. I have nothing to bring on my own. I'm utterly dependent on you. Here's how David uh, in Psalm 16, 8, I love this. He says, I have set the Lord always before me, and because he is with me and he is at my right hand, I'm not going to be able to do it, and I got this on my own strength. No, he says, because the Lord is with me, I shall not be shaken. This is why this is the first and most important 
statement. All the other statements have this idea of, of being filled up. This one has the idea of, of being emptied. Uh, we, we can't fill something until we empty it. One scholar said it this way, you cannot be uh, worthwhile until you are worthless. It's kind of like when you want to uh, remodel a home. Before you do any renovation, you have to do demo, right? So to be poor in spirit means I admit, God, I can't do this without you. I can't control my tendencies to do the right and wrong thing. And, and, and ultimately, my life is unmanageable. I need you. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. I'm always acknowledging my dependence on God. Let me show you some examples in Scripture, and then I'm going to give you a couple takeaways. Now, these are powerful men of God. But when in the presence of God, when in the very presence of God, they realized their poverty of spirit spirit. Isaiah. Isaiah was a gifted preacher and a godly uh, man. And, and by today's standards, people would be clamoring into auditoriums to hear Isaiah teach. Uh, let me put it this way to modernize it. He would have millions of followers on Twitter, okay? <laughs> and at one point in his ministry, he has this, un, this remarkable experience when he has a vision of God. Check it out, Isaiah 6. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And this dwarfed everything inside of him. Uh, in other words, the presence of God makes everything else look small. Here's what he says after that. Woe is me. Like, like I'm, 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 I'm ruined. One translation says, I am lost, for, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am living amongst the people with unclean lips, but my eyes have yet seen the Lord. Uh, we see this in Daniel, one of the, the brightest and smartest people to ever live. When he saw the Lord, here's what he says, so I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deadly pale, and I was helpless. We see the same attitude in Peter, who by nature was an a, a aggressive, uh, self-assertive, confident individual. Yet when he encounters the Lord, look at his reaction. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. See, what, what Jesus is saying in this beatitude is uh, where, when a man comes to understand that he is spiritually poor, that is the doorway to being blessed. Let me show you one more example. There's a, a parable in the book uh, of Luke chapter 18, and it's a tax collector and a Pharisee. And they both go up to the temple to pray, right? Well, uh, one, we would call him rich in spirit, and the other one, we would call him poor in spirit. So the Pharisee, he's rich in spirit, right? So they both go to this temple, and the Pharisee, of course, what do you think he's going to do? He goes right to the front, like he would probably come right up here, and he starts praying loud for everybody to hear him, right? Because that's what Pharisees do. They want to show their righteousness to be, be before people, like, look at me. And he literally prays this, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, you know, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulteress, or even like that schmuck tax collector right there, all right? I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. Pretty impressive, right? But here's what Jesus said in this parable. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to the heaven, but he beat his chest. Now, this is not beating his chest like my son was doing, <laughs> right? This meant I have nothing to bring, and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this man, rather than the other, went home justified or went home blessed uh, before God. This, this destitute, bankrupt, poor in spirit tax collector was blessed. Why? For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who come humbly will be exalted by the Lord. Now, here's the problem for us today. Most people, especially here in America, uh, and especially in affluent places, we don't realize how uh, poor we actually are. We, we don't realize how much we actually have. It's, it's hard for you to realize you have a lot because you're just kind of, uh, you've been in a place where you've always been able to do something about it. Something, uh, to, you know, be, you had options. I don't know if you know this, but we are incredibly blessed, everybody incredibly blessed. Like 99.5% of the world would trade places with you on your worst day. They, they really would. 
so, so here we are, abundantly blessed, and the problem is we never depend on, on something we don't think we, we need. And I'm convinced that the more I dig into this, that it really to be poor in spirit is, is for people who say, man, I can't get this on my own. And, and I'm not trying to insult you, but I, I think most people actually think we, we can now, what made this come alive for me was the first time I went on, on a mission trip. If anybody's ever been on a mission trip, you'll know what I'm talking about. And you think you go there to, to be an encouragement to those minis- uh, missionaries and to the people, but you actually get encouraged uh, by going there because you get perspective of what life is really all about, right? And if you've never been on a mission trip, I encourage you to go and go to a place where there is nothing, like absolutely nothing. And, and you'll realize that the vast majority of the earth lives like that. And what you'll notice is when you get there is they're happier than you are. I arrived, uh, you know, when I was 15 years old and I had my Sony Walkman on, you right? I had my Michael Jordan jersey and I had my shoes on and I thought, you know, I was so cool and oh man. And I looked around and those kids were so happy and it made me look miserable, right? It really did. There's nothing like pulling up with a van full of teenagers and you just see these kids who have one set of clothes who probably eat only one time of day and they're just so happy and they have tears in their eyes because somebody showed up to play ball with them right somebody's there to just to just be with them they had no worries in the world and they were happy you know why because they're completely destitute everybody and all they got is God and so they lean into the Lord and those are the ones who are blessed it's kind of what this is trying to say, and, and, and that's why this is so uh, such a difficult principle to teach. How do you teach being poor in spirit to somebody who is everything? That, that's us, right? There, there's a verse in, in Revelation. I'll show you this, and it's, it's a really convicting verse. Now, the book of Revelation is the ba- last book uh, in, in your Bible, and it's considered a prophetic book. It's the only prophetic book in the New Testament. And the Apostle John, he writes this book uh, along with his Gospel of John, and then 1, 2, and 3 uh, uh, John. And, and he's writing this book because he receives this revelation on the island of Patmos. And he had this vision of what the end times would look like. In fact, that's what uh, Revelation actually literally means it means apocalypse right so so it's the end of time so this is what the end is going to look like but in the first three chapters of that book chapters one two and and three Jesus is there so Jesus appears to John in his glorified body Uh, this is the same Jesus that spent time with John on the earth he appears to him and 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 I would encourage you to go read chapters two and three it's a really easy read just takes a few minutes but Jesus through uh, through some angels gives seven messages to seven Seven churches in Asia Minor. And I believe those seven uh, messages can be applied to the church today. But there's one that I want to highlight for you, and that's uh, to the last church, the church of Laodicea. It goes something like this. Watch this. I know your deeds. So I know that you do good outreach, Journey. I know that you do food baskets. I know that you serve and, and you're loving this community, and I'm excited about that. But I also know that you're either hot nor cold. Uh, tepid is actually what that's called, right? So, so I'm a bit of a foodie, right? I, I love food. And I, what I know about food, it's either got to be really hot or, or really cold, right? Think about sushi. It's either really cold or, or really hot. It can't be in between. It's, it's no good if it's in between. Believe me, don't eat it, okay? So he says, I wish you were either one or the other. So it's not really talking about a Christian or or a non-Christian. But he says, because you are lukewarm, so neither hot nor cold. In other words, you're not one or the other. Now, again, lukewarmness is is an attitude, okay? It's when you say, I I think I'm okay. You know, I show up Sundays once uh, an hour on Sunday, and I I, I serve a little, and I, I do just enough. And he says, because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now watch this. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. And then here's what Jesus says. But you do not re- realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Real vague about how he felt, huh? <laughs> and I would love to, what I would love for us uh, to, to realize and what would, uh, I would love for us to happen on the inside of every heart is to realize really how wretched, pitiful, poor, and naked we are without Jesus. And if you ever get to the place where, where I don't have anything except by him and then everything else I, I still need is going to come from him and I cannot get these things on myself, guess what? Blessed, happy, 
You're going to end up being the happiest person you know. Being poor in spirit is not finding the champion within. It's realizing the need that you actually have. So here's what I thought I'd do uh, as we close. I'm going to give you two takeaways, two, okay? Now, I know some of you Baptists are thinking, well, wait, there's a three-point sermon coming. Why, why not three? Okay, bear with me, right? I've given you three before, and they were no good. I'm going to give you two that are good, okay? <laughs> now, these two are attitudes of the heart that are in complete opposition to themselves and are in complete opposition to being poor in spirit to how God calls us to be uh, uh, blessed, right? One is very arrogant and boastful, prideful. The other is very belittling and condemning. Write these down if you're taking notes. The first one is this. I think I have something to offer God. So this is like that self-righteousness attitude, right? God did really well to save me, right? Do you know who I am? I got pulled over once. By the way, don't ever tell a cop that. Uh, do you know who I am? It, it just doesn't end well, okay? <laughs> That's a story for another day. But I've told you my story uh, throughout the years, if you've been around. I grew up in church and, uh, you know, actually went to church on Sundays twice. We would go Sunday mornings and then Sunday nights. Uh, there's a reason we don't have Sunday night services here, probably because I still have some PTSD from going so much, right? And, and we went Thursday nights on top of that. And I would read my Bible and I'd memorize verses and I sang the songs and I sang in the choir. By the way, these are not all bad things. Uh, they were foundational in my life, but as an adult, they left me rich in spirit, okay? Now, that sounds like a good thing, right? But Jesus refers to the rich in spirit as the religious, as the Pharisees, as the self-righteous, the ones that praise him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. And that's exactly who I was. And I thought, man, the more I do for God, then surely the kingdom of heaven is for me. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 the kingdom doesn't work like that. See, I think people think that, that we have some sort of role in, in salvation. If I come to church, if I give, if I serve, if I say I'm sorry, Right? Do you realize that, that you can ask for forgiveness of your sins and they won't be forgiven? Because it's not just the forgiveness of sins that forgives your sins. Your sins are forgiven whenever they are paid for. Not sure if you realize that or not, but God doesn't come along and says, well, well, thank you for trying so hard. Thank you for trying to be a good person. And, and you know what? You're, you're trying to be spiritual, and you did say you're sorry, so, so I guess I should forgive you, right? That's not how it plays out. The Bible says that we've all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And the wage of that sin, look at Romans 6, uh, 23, is death. That's the only payment that's accepted for the sin. And I'm not trying to be heavy on you. I'm, I'm just trying to help you. You have to realize that someone has to pay for the sin that you and I did. And the payment isn't, I'm sorry. And it's not doing things that are spiritual. No, sin has a bill attached to it. And that bill is death. But the gift of God, come on somebody, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus came, stepped into your life, and because of Jesus, I have the free gift of salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. But we have to understand he's done it all, and I bring nothing to the table. And it wasn't until in my mid-20s uh, that I came to the place where I realized, man, spiritually, I can't do anything to earn the kingdom of God. And in that moment, the words of Jesus just washed over my life. And I understood this beatitude, blessed happy. Adrian, yours is the kingdom of God. Your nothingness, knowing that you have nothing to offer and nothing to do about it. God says, I can work with that. The kingdom of heaven is for you. So the poor in spirit have nothing. They notice their need. They know they are nothing. This is the kingdom of heaven, and this is good news for you and I. Here's the second one. And this is in complete opposition to that first one, and, and that is this. I wallow in self-pity, right? Like I flounder. I'm not, the, I'm not the boastful, arrogant, but I'm just like, woe is me. 
groveling, self-loathing. Well, well, this is just who I am, and I just got to cope with my pain, and I'm just going to put a Band-Aid on it, right? And, 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 and I just got to put up with, with my personhood, like, like who you are is who you are, and what happened is, is what happened. And you get into this, like, self-loathing posture, and I'm just learning to get over it, still, still kind of hating people and still being hurt by people. I'm just trying to cope and, and do the best I can. I'm just kind of working through my issues, right? We, and we say things like, well, well, you know, my, my, my daddy was a mad person. My grandfather was a mad person. I'm just a mad person. That's just in our blood, right? Like, like you do know I'm Irish, right? That's just in my blood. Or, or we say things like, you know, my, my, my dad was a drunk and, and my grandpa was a drunk. And, and, and I'm just, that's just what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be a, a, a drunk and, and just, just pray for me, right? Just, just pray. This is the situation. If you find yourself in this situation today, let me just tell you, this is not what God has for you. This is not the kingdom of God to just kind of make it through life and, and woe is me, just pray for me. I'm still hurting through the issue. Pray for me. I still got these issues. It's not what it's about. Let me, let me tell you who I was uh, without Jesus. I was an insecure, bullied, 13-year-old, shy person. I, I, and I, I didn't really know what to even do with my insecurities other than to, to act out. So, so I didn't clam up. I kind of went crazy. I figured, man, I'm, I'm just going to be, uh, you know, the jester and just throw jokes at everybody and just make everybody laugh. And that's how I'm going to deal with my insecurities. And I, and I was just still insecure, right? Um, in fact... <laughs> I, uh, I applied in, in my early college career. I went to Mount Hood Community College, everybody. Shout out to Troutdale right there. But the reason I applied to Mount Hood Community College is because I was so insecure to apply at other colleges. I didn't think they would want me. I didn't think that, that I, I would get in. And, and so I'm shy and insecure. And then they make you take this speech class, speech 101, right? And, and I took this speech class and I hated being in front of people. I really did. I, I could not talk. And, and, uh, and I was just so insecure to be in front of people. And guess what, everybody? I failed speech class class at Mount Hood Community College. <laughs> Y'all, this ain't Stanford. This is Mount Hood. They don't even speak English over there. Like, like if you don't make it there, you just don't pass. You, you don't make it, right? But then God got a hold of my heart. And look what the Lord has done now. Now, I know I'm not the best speaker on the planet, but man, I'm not nervous anymore, and I'm not insecure, and I'm confident, not in myself, but I'm confident who God made me to be. He transformed my life. Coming poor in spirit means I give Jesus the power to be healed and transformed. Uh, let me show you this in Scripture. He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in the body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. Watch the rest of it. You were like sheep going astray. So without Jesus, we were all wandering. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of, say that last word with, you, with me, what is it? Souls. Do you know that you have an overseer of your soul? So, so your soul, the condition of your soul right now, whatever it is, that condition, it can be healed by the power of God. And, and, and that's my prayer for you. All right, I got one minute left in two verses. You guys with me? I'm going to close, and I want to show you what the blessed assurance is when you come to the Lord poor in spirit. Watch this. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs. What's the word there? Is the kingdom of God, is the kingdom of God. So, so when we don't come to him with, with our prideful attitude and, Lord, I bring all this to the table, and when we don't just grovel and woe is me and I just can't make it through life and God's not going to transform me or heal me, when we come poor in spirit, ours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's interesting about this is that the kingdom of heaven is promised in the present tense. See, we often think of the kingdom as kind of there and then, something that's far off, something that is una unattainable, right? And really, this beatitude, if we were going to write it, is like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven. That's, it's going to come once and for all. But Jesus doesn't say that, 
What makes this even more striking is that all the other blessings promised to us are in the future. Watch this, the, the rest of them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the weak, for they will inherit. Blessed are those who hunger, for they will be fed. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure, for they will, for they will, for they will. You kind of get the you get the idea here. The last one said, blessed uh, is, is when, when, when uh, you're persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, so the the Beatitudes are kind of bookended by this, like, theirs is the kingdom of heaven in real time. What is Jesus saying here? What does it mean for you and I who are struggling, trying to cope with life, trying to get through everything that we got to get through? Listen very carefully. You can enjoy a taste of heaven right now. The poor in spirit. And those who come and say, man, I'm coming empty before you, God. I need you. I have that attitude. They taste the greatest blessing of heaven, and that is the very presence of God with them. That's, that's what heaven is. This is what God declares in Isaiah. Watch this, last verse. For this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and a holy place, but also with the one who is what? Contrite and lowly in spirit. Why do I do that? To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. See what is being said here? Jesus, or, or God, lives in two different places, right? So he dwells in heaven. He's on high, in the most high places. But he also dwells with the person who has this right attitude. Man, I'm poor in spirit. Jesus, I'm bankrupt without you. Jesus, I can't do this without you. God, I need you. I'm, I'm completely destitute without you. I, I can't make it. Heaven is to live with God. The poor in spirit get to taste before they get to heaven because God comes from heaven to them. Heaven comes to the humble before the humble get to heaven. So if you want to move beyond kind of relating to God in these two attitudes, by the way, worship team, you can come up because we're going to close, of this like prideful, arrogant, I got this, I'm going I'm to bring this to the Lord. You can move from that to, man, God, I need you. I'm coming before you. And, and, and I acknowledge I bring nothing of my own. And, and, and I don't want to self-follow and woe is me. No, no, I want to be transformed. I want to be healed. I want to have the right attitude that everything that I do is all because of you.